Well, hello everyone and welcome to Reading Through the Bible with Elder Linda. So glad you could join me and just asking that you give me a thumbs up or um, that you would subscribe to the channel if you're so inclined to. But today we're going to be talking about and discussing um, chapter 12 or completing chapter 12. We read it yet last week. <clears throat> And in chapter 12, we're going to be discussing the Abraham covenant. We're going to hit that just a little bit more. Uh, the fact that Abraham was rich. Uh, we will talk about why Abraham felt that he had to lie and say that Sarah was his, was his sister. Hmm. Wow. People in the Bible actually lie? We're going to get into some of that. Uh, and we will talk a little about concubines since Sarah might just find herself being a concubine. Interesting. And we were going to, we're going to end chapter 12 by talking about how God protected Abraham and Sarah and compare that to how God protects us as part of our covenant, as part of the Abraham covenant. Protection is one of um, the conveniences that we receive underneath that covenant. We'll also read chapter 13 and depending on how much time we have left, we're going to get into um, discussing the events that took place in chapter 13. <clears throat> Amen. So let's just start with the word of prayer. Holy Spirit, we just are so grateful for this opportunity to study your word. We pray that you would come in and be the teacher. Show us those things that we've not seen before. Enlighten us, Holy Spirit. Teach us, oh God. Lord, we're hungry for your word. We ask that you bless everyone that's even listening to this video, Father. Father, that you would give them what they need to hear on today. We give you all the praise, honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, amen. Let's just jump right in. <clears throat> in chapter 12, we, we read that last week and we started with that. Um, we ended with that, rather. And we ended talking about the Abrahamic covenant. So just as a summation of that, just real briefly, the Abrahamic covenant, what is with the things that God promised to Abraham and his seed, uh, Abraham and his descendants. And you'll find that in Genesis chapter 12, verse one through three uh, is where God starts speaking to him about that. But in essence, the summation of his promise is no, number one was protection. God promises to protect Abraham. He promised him land, number two, and that goes to prosperity. Number three, God promised it a great reputation, that his name will be great, which is, means his reputation. And how many people know that everybody knows who Abraham is? Most people know who Abraham is. Uh, if you've studied the word, uh, if you read your Bible, you're going to find out who Abraham is. So his name was made great. Everyone gets to know who Abraham is. And he promised Abraham, number four, heirs. He said that his descendants would be as the sand of the sea and as the stars of the sky. That's a lot of descendants. That's a lot of seed that comes up after you. And he also said, and the fifth thing was that all the families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham and his seed. All the family. So again, we pointed out last week that even when God was cho choosing Abraham to be the father of the Jewish nation, the Jewish people that he was going to uh, show himself through, he was still thinking about all the families of the earth. And in number four and five, the heirs being as the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky and having all the families of the earth be blessed to Abraham. All that was fulfilled when Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ is a descendant of Abraham. So he is part of Abraham's seed. And it says, through you and your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So that was fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, there are so many heirs uh, being like the sand of the sea. Think about how many Christians are actually in the world today. I don't even know if you can count them. We're, we're all over the place. Uh, there's a scripture that said, I have yet 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. So uh, even when you feel like you're all alone, you're not. There are Christians tucked away in all, all sorts of places that we don't even know about. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, that was fulfilled in Jesus. So in verse 4 in chapter 12, 
we note that uh, that Lot went with Abraham. Now, remember, God had told Abraham to leave his country, his kindred, and he's going to go to a place that uh, he would show him, show them. Well, Lot is kind of deciding to tag along with Abraham. So all the relatives haven't left Abraham yet. He's still got Lot tagging along. It appears that, and it appears it wasn't Abraham's decision. It appears, it appears that Lot just decided to tag along. But uh, Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. And in uh, chapter 12, verse 1, is where God told him to leave his country and his kindred and everyone. So he did actually leave uh, his father, he left him in Haran, and he was 75 years old. We find that in verse 4. And he headed for Canaan. Now, at this point, Terah would have been 145 years old. Remember, he was 70 years old when he had Abram. Abraham's now 75. So 70 plus 75, that would give him, that would make Terah 100, his father 145 years old uh, when he, uh, when Abraham left him there in Haran. So he was alive when Abraham left him. And Terah actually died 60 years later at the age of 205. Uh, which means when his dad died, Abram was 135 years old. So it appears <clears throat> that Abraham continued to travel in the direction of his father, that his father had started to go on. Remember, we, we talked about uh, Terah um, uh, left Ur of the Chaldeans and he started heading toward Canaan land for some reason. Doesn't tell us that God told him to do that, but he just started doing that. And he stopped in Haran, H-A-R-A-N, and that's where he stayed until he died. Well, now Abram has received a call of God saying, leave your country and your kin and go to a land that I will show you. So Abraham gets up and he leaves with Sarah and Lot. And he leaves with, um, in verse 5, it tells us that Abraham was very, he was very wealthy. He took his, his wealth when he took his wife, he took Sarah, his nephew, Lot, and all his wealth. He had livestock and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran. And he headed for Canaan land. So Abraham was wealthy. How many people know God wants us to have more than enough? You know, it, it doesn't make you holy to be poor. Um, and, and, I, and I'm not downing poor people because we all go through things. There's times when... Uh, we can't make ends meet and we have to trust God to make those ends meet. But what my point is saying that God wants us to prosper. He wants us to have more than enough. Amen. So we have Abraham on his way to Canaan land with Sarah and Lot. And, and just another point I want to make that not, not all the servants that Abraham had were slaves. Many of them were voluntarily employed. So he had servants, he had uh, livestock, he had, he was rich. Um, now in verse six, I want you to, something I want you to see in verse six of chapter 12. Um, in verse six, it talked about Abraham camping beside an oak tree called Mora, M-O-R-E-H. This is significant because this tree of Mora at Shechem, um, according to the Quest Study Bible, this tree was a sacred place for worshiping pagan gods. So worshiping gods that were not the God. Abram challenged them by building an altar there to the true God. So that's really strategic. Abraham knew that they were worshiping idols there. So he's going to show them who the true God is. He actually built excuse me, built an altar there to worship God. In verse seven, in verse seven, it was not until Abraham arrived in Canaan when God told him he would give him that land, give him that land to his descendants. So again, we're talking about the faith of Father Abraham. God told him in verse one to leave your country and your kindred and go to a land that I'm going to show you. And he got up and he did just that, not even knowing what land that was. 
but he moved in the direction that his father was going in toward Canaan land. And then when he gets to Canaan land, that's when God tells him, I'm going to give you this land, you and your descendants. I'm going to give your descendants this land. And remember the interesting thing about Canaan, Canaan, if you recall, when we talked about Canaan was Ham's son. Remember the three sons of Noah, Sham, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the one that saw his father drunk and naked, and he uh, didn't cover his father, but he went and told his brothers, and uh, they end up coming back to cover him up. And remember when Noah woke up from his stupor, he cursed, not Ham, who uh, hadn't covered him. He cursed Ham's son, and Ham's son was called Canaan. So now we're, he we're hear hearing that God is going to take Canaan's land from them, descendants of Canaan. They're going to take that land from them and give it to the children of Israel, give it to the Jews, give it to Abraham and his seed, this new people that God's just starting to uh, bring together. So that's interesting to note. Uh, <clears throat> And also note that this, uh, at this time, the land of Canaan was filled with people who practiced idolatry. So, you know, it, it wasn't that the Canaanites were such a nice, sweet people, but they really were not, um, they were practicing idolatry. They were worshiping other idols. In verses seven through nine, it says, Abraham built two altars in two different places to worship the Lord. Now, we talked about that before, that in Abraham's day, Building altars and making sacrifice was how they worshiped God. So Abraham's doing a lot of worshiping. And although they had an altar there for their pagan God, Abraham had to build new altars to the living God. He couldn't even use their altars. He had to build uh, altars to God Almighty. In verse 8, the King James Version states that Abraham called upon the name of the Lord. By doing this, Abraham was publicly evangelizing and telling people about God by making this, this sacrifice on the altar. This was not a private prayer. So Abraham wasn't being all hush and quiet and hoping nobody see him. No, he was publicly, publicly declaring God is God. Everyone can see a sacrifice being offered and Abraham praising God. So by praising God and proclaiming God, he was fulfilling part of that covenant promise. He was being a blessing to people because for the first time, maybe some of them were actually getting a, a view of this true living God. And, you know, which brings us to how we worship God. You know, they did through the sacrifices. We worship God by presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. We give God all that we are. Our will, what is all that we are, is our, it includes our will, our ways, our emotions, our desires, etc. And that doesn't mean that we walk around and we do this perfectly every day because we're not perfect. There are some days where, you know, our will and God will and God's will butt heads because we want to do one thing and God's telling us to do something else. And we might be stagnant for a minute because we haven't given God a yes in that area. And all he wants to hear us is say, yes, not my will, but thine be done. And until we do, we, we might have that little struggle with us and God. Our ways, he said, our ways are not his ways. His ways are high above our ways. So oftentimes you have to just stop and quiet yourself and submit to God, what would you have me to do? How, many, how often do we ask God, what would you have me to do? And, and that we're willing and able and listening and ready to do what he tells us to do. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge me. If we acknowledge him in all our ways, he said he would direct our path. So if there's anybody out there searching and, and questioning and wanting God's direction for anything, acknowledge God. Acknowledge him by simply saying, God, what, what should I do? Show me, teach me, lead me, give me a sign. Give me a confirmation. And God said, if you ask for bread, he wouldn't give you a stone. So if you're asking him for, lead, for, for his guidance, he's going to give it to you. He's going to make sure you get that word somehow. Our emotions, our emotions have to be brought into check. Because how many people know sometimes our emotions go haywire? And, 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 and we 
you know, just, just even, even recently the other day, I had to talk to myself, talk myself down and say, okay, Linda, you are going to stop this and you are not going to be angry about this. You have to control your emotions because your emotions will run havoc on you. And it, it, it doesn't always work. Sometimes those emotions get the best of you and you, you blurt out or say something you shouldn't say or do something you shouldn't do. And, but even when you do that, thank God for his mercy and his grace. Because even the days when I can't quite get those emotions in control, the Holy Spirit is still there to say, but I got you. I'm praying for you. I'm going to keep you. And today's a new day. You don't have to be the same today as you were yesterday. You might have messed up. You might have failed on yesterday. You didn't quite get a hold of that emotion yesterday, but you got it today. Because today is a new day. And my mercies are new every morning. So you get those emotions in check. Our desires, you know, uh, sometimes we have desires that are not of God and we have to literally pray, God, uh, I, I submit my desires to you. If this is not you, then Lord, you take this from me. That's how you surrender your desires to him. This is how we present our bodies as a willing sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable to him. This is how we worship him by giving him all of us our will, our ways, our emotions, our desires, surrendering them to him. This is how we do it. You're just asking to take it because we, we know we're not perfect, but God is able to make us into what he would have us to be. So we bring, we also bring the sacrifice of praise in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. It says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer a, to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that openly profess his name. Amen. So even in our praise, we're professing his name. We're This is how we're worshiping him. And I'm comparing our worship to how Abraham worshiped him uh, on the, with the sacrifice and offering the animals up to him and the, and the aroma of the animal got there. Well, our worship is, is what we're talking about right now, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, offering him our will and our ways and our emotions that God, you take it. And singing songs to him, professing his name, praising him. All of this is part of worshiping God. In Romans 12, 1, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. God is so worthy. We owe him so much. Jesus came and saved us from damnation. All that he has done for us, we can't do anything but praise and worship him. All the ways he's kept us. All these years, we used to sing these, this song, all these years, Lord, you've been good to me all these years. And when you think about the goodness of God and how he kept you and how he's keeping you right now, keeping you safe from all hurt, harm, and danger, you have to praise him. It says, let, in verse, uh, continuing in Romans 12, 1, it says, let them be a living and a holy sacrifice. Talking about presenting your body, your whole self. The kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him by presenting your whole self to him. Holding up and back. Holding up and back. God, here I am. Do with me as you will. I surrender to you. My will, my way, my emotion, anything, my desires, anything that's not like you, God, I ask you to cleanse you, cleanse me, change me. That's how we worship him. Verse 10 through 13, back in chapter 12 of Genesis, says, due to a famine in, Can in Canaan, <clears throat> Abraham went down to Egypt, fearful that Pharaoh would kill him because of his beautiful wife. Now, at this time, Sarah was 65 years old, according to the NIV study Bible. And he told Sarah, his wife, Abraham told Sarah, to say that she was his sister. Now, this is kind of a half truth because she actually was his half sister. And we talked about that before. She was the daughter of his father, but not of his mother. But remember what a lie is. A lie is anything that's told to deceive someone. So Abraham really was trying to deceive them. He was telling a half truth. Uh, he wasn't telling them the whole story. He just said, she's my sister. Okay. Um, uh, and you find that in Genesis 20, 12, where it talk, tells us that that was his, um, more than just his sister. It was half, his half-sister. She was also his wife. So 
And we talked about that before, how the custom in the old days was that you, you should marry a relative. Now, later on in the Bible, they're going to do away with that custom. But right now, uh, this is the custom that they, uh, that you should marry a relative, a close relative. So note that because now Abraham's having to go to Egypt because there's a famine in the land. So there's a famine in Canaan. They need to get some food. So he's traveling to Egypt. So he tells Sarah, please say that you are my sister because I don't want them to kill me because of you. In verse, oh, well, uh, a note about Egypt. Now, Egypt is a place, and you're going to find out later on, um, where that Joseph actually saved his family by going to Egypt. We'll talk about that later. But Egypt is a place where they, they usually had food, even in the time of famine, because of the Nile River. There's a Nile River that went straight through Egypt. And so they always had water to water the land. No matter how dry it got, they had the Nile River. In verse 15, Pharaoh intended to make Sarah one of his concubines. So he took her into his palace because Sarah was so beautiful. She was so beautiful that he wanted her and he took her into his palace and to make her a concubine. So I said, we're going to talk about concubine a little bit so you can understand, so we can get a little bit of understanding of what, um, what they mean, because you'll see this word again, um, as we continue to study the Bible, but who were the concubines in the Bible? And this came from the Smith's Bible Dictionary that I was able to uh, pull this out. But a concubine would usually be either a Hebrew girl sold by her father. You'll find that in Exodus 21, verse 7. Or a concubine could be a Gentile captive taken in war. So a Gentile, anybody that wasn't a Jew, taken in war. Number three, it could be a purchased sovereign, I mean foreign, a purchased foreign slave. Or four, it could be a Canaanite woman. There's that Canaanite again. Canaanite woman, bonded or free. Now, the first two were protected by the law. So uh, Exodus 21, 7 talked about the Hebrew girl that was sold by her father. And she has some rights and and the second one that could be a concubine was a Gentile captive taken in war. And there are some rules and laws about how you're supposed to conduct yourself with the Gentile captive. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 10 through 14. But the foreign, uh, the foreign slave is that this situation was not recognized by the law because the law insisted that concubines not be treated as slaves. Concubines were not supposed to be treated by as slaves. And that's according to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 14. Forced slavery and human trafficking was against the Hebrew law. And we're going to find that in Exodus chapter 21, verse 16. So we haven't gotten that far, but that's where the Hebrew law will speak about that. That kidnappers were actually supposed to be put to death. You know, you couldn't kidnap people. And the fourth... Uh, person that could be a concubine was the Canaanite woman. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3 through 4, God warned the Hebrews not to intermarry with people from Canaan because they worship false gods. And their worshiping the false god are often included human sacrifice and sexual religious practices. So um, the last two weren't weren't uh weren't even covered or they didn't have any rights at all that were recognized because um god did not condone it the jews even mixing with the canaanite women so the rights of concubines in the bible uh the, a woman's status as a concubine was higher than a slave but lower than a wife and we're going over this like i said because you're going to see this concubine thing happening and and having a concubine um they actually had sex with these women the whoever owned them had sex with them and uh treat them as if they were another wife besides their wife did god agree to these concubines no how do we know that because in genesis god created uh the world just the way he wanted it to be with a man and a woman 
If God wanted Adam to have concubines, he would have created Adam and Eve and then made uh, 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 Beth and whoever else to be his concubines. He could create all of them at the same time. No. He says, of the twain, um, that the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, that's a man and a woman. So God did not attend, intend for there to be concubines. However, he's allowing this. The same way he's allowing all these other things that mankind is doing. Uh, murdering each other and, and doing other stuff that they're doing. And God is allowing it because a sin has entered the world. So sin is going to have his full cup because remember, God has a plan on how he's going to combat this sin, how he's going to get this sin out of his world. He's going to send his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has not come yet. So we're going to, you're going to yet see some things that's going to make you go, wow, they did that in the Bible. Yes, because sin is in the Bible. Sin was released when Adam and Eve sinned. They released sin into the world. And so the prince of this world, Satan is allowing them to, is, is causing them to do all kinds of things. But anyway, there's, now they have concubines. God has not lowered the boom on them. He's allowing them to do this. But a woman's status as a concubine was higher than a slave, but lower than a wife. Concubines were entitled to proper food and clothing. So if you had a concubine, you were either rich, usually, or you were a king because you had to take care of these women. You had to feed them, clothe them, give them a place to stay. You took care of them. So you had to have some money. So it was either rich people that had concubines or it was kings. Concubines could not get a bill of divorce like a wife could. And a concubine's children were legitimate. So they were actually uh, uh, recognized when they had children for their masters or for their the um, whoever they were with. But they may have been, they had their children were legitimate, but they may have been socially considered secondary to the children born from a wife. So uh, oftentimes when they couldn't have children back in those days, they would get their concubines uh, or their handmaids to have children for um, for their masters so that they could have heirs. So they were not legally entitled to an inheritance. I'm talking about the children of the concubine. But they were sometimes included in their father's will. So it depended on the father. They, they weren't entitled to anything, but oftentimes their father would give them something. And we'll see that later because... There are some people that actually did that. So that is what a concubine is. And this is where Sarah is finding herself about to be a concubine because they have lied. Um, Pharaoh thinks that Sarah is Abram's sister. So he was bringing Sarah into his house to be one of his concubines. Verse 16, Pharaoh made Abram even richer because of Sarah by giving him animals and servants and camels, etc. Now, Abram's getting richer. He was rich before he got to, to Egypt. Now he's becoming richer. Because according to the Nelson Study Bible, having a camel during this time was like having an expensive limousine. So the, the fact that Abram has given cam he has camels now, he's rich. Okay, he's, he's, he's riding around in limos. In, in our day and time, that's what it would mean. It, was, it would be the same as. Verse 17 through 18, God sent, now listen, listen to this, God sent terrible plagues on Pharaoh and his household because of Sarai. Somehow, Pharaoh found out Sarah was actually Abram's wife. And Pharaoh ordered Abraham to leave with his wife and all his possessions. And he had his men escort them out of the country. Now, I find this to be significant because remember, God's one of uh, the promises that he's going to protect us. God sent plagues on Pharaoh and his household. And it doesn't say how they found out that it was because of Sarah that they were getting all these plagues. But mind you, remember in olden days, they had sorcerers and people that did incantations and and the devil speaks to his own. So they could have been, been uh, warned or... Uh, shown that it's coming from Sarah. I don't know how they found out, but they found out that Sarah was actually Abraham's wife. Pharaoh was so upset that he uh, kicked them both out. He said he wanted them to leave, take all your possessions. And on top of that, he had his men escort them so nobody could mess with them. Talk about the protection of God. God will cause even your enemies to protect you. 
uh, you know, when you're the children of God, he takes care of you. Part of the covenant promise was for protection. God promised to protect Abraham. He protected them by sending plagues on Pharaoh's household as well as causing Pharaoh to send people out to uh, protect them and lead them out of the country. So God still protects us. Even when we make mistakes, God still protects us. Isn't God awesome? Because how many of you know we always make, make mistakes? We're not perfect. and But every time we make a mistake, God is right there to pick us up so we can shake the dust off, get up, and start over again. Don't stay there. When you make a mistake, don't stay in the dirt. Don't wall in the dirt. Don't say, oh, God can never use me. Okay, you messed up. Today's a new day. Yesterday you messed up, but guess what? Today you can get up and start all over again. God, forgive me. Lord, wash me. Make me clean. I messed up. I fell down again, Lord. Help me, Jesus. And he will. He will. Because he has unconditional love for us. Just like you do for your own um, natural son and daughter. Uh, they might not do everything you like, but you love them and you will do anything for them. You protect them the best you can even though you might not like some of their decisions and some of the things that they do. So God might not have been happy with Ab Abram lying about Sarah being his sister, but, and he, it was a half true, but he, um, he still protected them even in spite of that. So remember that, that as a child of God, all things work together for your good and know that God causes everything to work together. And that's in Romans 8, 28. And know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and called according to his purpose. God will cause all things to work together for your good. And we've heard many sermons about that. That doesn't mean that everything that happened to us is good, but God is going to cause it to work for our good. Somehow he's going to turn it around so that we're going to be okay. Amen. Because he loves us just that much. Amen. So, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to get to chapter 13 because the Holy Spirit had some other stuff for me to um, uh, bring out. But just know that wherever you are, whatever situation you are in, that God is going to work it out for your good. Keep praying. Keep looking to him. Keep trusting him and believing him, knowing that uh, God's got the situation under control. And though it might look crazy, though it might look like things are falling apart, it's going to work out for your good. Even though you might not understand it, it's going to work out for your good. Just trust him because he loves you so much. Amen. Amen. So let's just end with the word of prayer. Uh, because we're not going to get an opportunity to, to go into chapter 13, but we will start that on next week. So amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you, Lord God, for the word that we've had on today. Holy Spirit, I thank you, O oh God, that you're teaching us, O oh Lord, how we need to uh, look to you for all things and know that all things is working together for our good. Holy Spirit, we honor you, we praise you, we magnify you. Lord, we're so glad, O oh God, that even though we're imperfect, even though we make mistakes, O oh God, that you love us so much that you keep your hands upon us and that you yet protect us, even when we don't even know we're being protected, God. Holy Spirit, we honor you, we praise you, and we magnify you, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So I just wanted to um, make sure you go to the channel. Those that uh, have not accepted Christ into your heart, uh, there's a, a video called The Sinner's Prayer. It's a short version with an explanation of what that all means. Please give your heart to Jesus. Tomorrow's not promised to any of us. Please do it today. Listen to the video, and um, there is a prayer on there that will lead you to Christ. And then after you listen to that video, there's another video called Teaching the Teaching About Salvation. Go on there so you can get all those scriptures that'll give you some understanding as to what salvation is all about. Amen. Amen. So next week, we will actually start on chapter 13. God bless you.